Greetings. What would you do if you had to put in a working homeless camp right in your neighborhood? Well, we're going to take a look at a successful adaptation, if you will, and see just what happened, how they did it, and how this shelter for the homeless, or a homeless camp, if you will, uh, takes off. First of all, a lot of volunteer work comes in. We can see here we've got a volunteer up on the roof. Uh, here we have a person who's actually putting some solar panels on top of her village. Uh, it's very small. These things are almost like a tool shed. If you want to see it, it's currently at 111 North Garfield in Eugene, Oregon. Runs good. Now, to get this thing going, it took a little bit of community activism. There was a lot of hesitancy about doing this. How do you start? Well, you get some solar panels and some of these cement blocks, and you start laying the foundation. And that's basically a wheelbarrow and a shovel like this, and the very first board is laid. Well, volunteers show up, and little by little, the community pitches in, and they really do on something like this. The religious community, it does, and the permit process gets better. And one after another, these little villages go up. Now, off-site, it was determined these old retirees could do a great job of pre-making these, kind of prefabrication. An old-timer who has some experience, his own tools, does an amazing amount of work here. Several of them did. Some of the villagers, sadly, could not even read a tape measure, so they were not able to help. Uh, some of the people in the community went out and, for instance, the only insulation package they have is this tar paper, and it gets cold. In fact, it gets slippery up on these roofs. But, you know, you could feel a type of energy take place. Now, nutritional needs, well, a little herb garden started out with just a box like this. It worked okay, so made two boxes. And they faced them into the sun and tried to get the herbs to grow. Everybody thought it was going to be okay. And unfortunately, what do you think happened? Well, yeah, a snap, snap frost went in, hit and killed it all. And that was the end of that. Now, there's no water, no one running water into the homes themselves. Propane tanks like this serve just to, uh, as a community burner to warm water to wash your plastic plates, your plastic fork, your plastic cup, and your plastic uh, knife. They tried to make a little larger herb garden like this. Uh, it all, also met the same fate. Washing dishes, each villager is expected to wash his own plates like this, and it got real cold. Uh, that you did the bit now, not to be confused across the street on Roosevelt, this is more like a civilian containment camp or concentration camp. Both these are real close to the map on civilian shelters. It felt like a concentration camp in this place. This is not Opportunity Village, this is a different one. All night long, you hear traffic noise going down. Boy, it's tough. Little by little, the pressures. This is a a special thing for putting for this gentleman's wheelchair, and the tension and pressure is just etches on everyone's face. But uh, let's go back to the regular Opportunity Village. There's a little bit more life, a little bit more uh, happiness, and more more work's getting done. Well, this thing is taking shape now. A place called Thrivent, which is a bunch of uh, is Lutherans. Uh, it's a community, a kind of a well, it helps people. You have to look it up online. I believe it's part of a Fortune 500 company. They kind of undergirded a little bit of this, as well as some of the Lane County and things like that. Very low key, you wouldn't even know they did it. I just happened to uncover it when I was taking these photographs on one of the, uh, some piece of information that I saw there. And then some of the community didn't like the idea. Others says, let's get going. Now this one here, you almost get claustrophobia in just a little window, but you know, you learn to take it. And you lay one, you start with another one. Now, some of these had an overhang where you could roll up and sleep, in the, and uh, I tried it, not sleeping, just laying up in there. It was a mixed bag. Now, this woman was able to get some donated paint, apparently in a roller, and to paint the raw wood up on her ceiling, and the villagers are encouraged to take an active part. There's only one community faucet, and that serves to wash your hands, wash your face, and brush your teeth right here. That's all they had at the time for, for all the months that I was there filming this. It was kind of sad, especially when it got cold and the snow hit and the ice. But, uh, you know, let, let, here's how it happened. This is how you washed your teeth, or there was a community bar of soap, and spray hit, and that was it. And that's life. Now, you're not supposed to have criminals or pets in these places. And unfortunately, it seems like both those rules get broken. Here's, you know, it's just a matter of time till a dog got in here. And uh, that, that's, that's life. Again, I'll show this. See the, uh, the solar panels up there above her head? I want you, those two serve this person well. Now here's that lane in Douglas County. There's the Thrivent, the Lutherans, and uh, we had one other member that did a good job. They helped from day number one, very low key as I said. Well, as things started to wind up, we had they had to put in what's called a, a yurt, a big large 20, 30 foot yurt, so that started to be worked on. 
Here you can see some chips were donated, and uh, it became to look like a community now. It really did. It just looked great. There was an ebullient spirit. Some energy was in the air, and then the snow hit, freezing. No insulation, no water, no toilet. But you just had to live and do the best you could. And this thing here was terrible. No insulation package. Boy, this was a rough gig. You had to crawl on your knees into there. This was a special stove donated. I believe it got a, an, a, an award from some kind of a deal. Very special stove. Uh, here's the yurt being placed in. This had a special aircraft type cable tensioning around it. Uh, here's the cable going in right here. These cables were all around the place for a yurt of that size. And those lattice work deals are called a snow load kit that was put on and ultimately there was snow that came that hit them. And here you can see how it, it almost like a guitar string it fits in there. Very uh, minimalist construction, very efficient construction, but it took a good person to set it up. Now to heat this, it took a, you had to have a red hot stove, a special insulated joint like this so it wouldn't burn the side of the tent down of the yurt. yurt. And uh, those don't come cheap. The stove itself was de donated, had some pellets. Uh, you could touch the outside, not get burnt. Anything above 40 was considered adequate, you know, at the time. They did the best they could. It was cold in there. Maintenance on this stove, it was running all the time during freezing conditions. And they had to have a, a, a staff, well, say a staff member volunteer, constantly take out these uh, the debris. There was a little lever to pull real hard that kind of cleaned the cleaning chamber. And then the side uh, mist kind of got built up like a creosote mist that had to be taken off. So when you run one of these things day and night, uh, it's, there's some things to learn. Well, let's go back and look at that earth. The city wouldn't give in. They made them put in this earthquake kit. These special augers went in just like this with these metal bands you can see there. And that had to go all the way around the earth. And uh, boy, each guy had to painstakingly jam these things in, these screws, and twist it with a ratchet wrench. This stuff was that very, very strong earthquake-resistant banding, and it was just like an auger went in. You can see how it grabbed the wood and pulled it straight down. This was a long, tedious process, and you can see here how this auger was twisted in there next to it to hold it down. The bolts had cuts, like you see on the right there, to slip in that, that metal band, and you just turned it. Finally, it got done, and this is what it looked like. You could have backed a truck into that, and I don't think it would have moved those with those earthquake kits in there. So up went the... Uh, Yurt, the stove got put in, and I'll just show you some more construction here in case you decide to put in <laughs> one of these in your in your neighborhood or you need to help somebody. Now the solar light, I waited till it was dark, and uh, the solar light in the top worked real, real good. There's this at full tension, the, the band there. Here, see that light? That's This whole thing is being lit by that light. It's fairly dark outside. Uh, the, and it's freezing. Oh, yeah, it's the outside of the yurt is freezing. There's crystals coming off of it. Uh, and so there you go. Now... There was a marriage, USA Today wrote this article about a couple that was being married when I was taking these photographs there, a homeless couple. They did. They had the, the well, a man of the peace, whatever they called him there, they didn't call him a reverend. Uh, he performed the ceremony, and the bride threw the bouquet, and then uh, there was just a, a brief celebratory kiss, and that way they had their first marriage there at Opportunity Village. All the time I was there, there was no broken glass, no crime, no cigarette butts, nothing. Here it is, if you want to... Look up in USA Today in their archives. You can read the article yourself. Well, Opportunity Village, that's what it's called. Now, the Thrivent people, let me see, here's a brief, uh, there they are right there. Here's the Thrivent. These are the people that helped to underwrite this and did some kind of behind-the-scenes help. Uh, here's getting these people off the street. That's a big deal. Some of the villagers, if you look at this, are actually on the city council, so to speak, talking about it, and they worked their way up that way. Now, we're running out of time here. This thing runs about, oh, I think 12 minutes long. We're about nine minutes now. But just look at, drink this in. We'll have a little roll call. Let's look at all these, some of these different designs that are here. There's the Cadillac there. Here's a regular one. All right. Now, a nice door with a lot of glass in it. Donated, of course, but that makes it nice and bright in there. <laughs> a big step getting in that one, but to each his own. This... Very, very efficient. Good bang for the buck on this one. And then here, of course, is the Cadillac. This was a nice one inside. I, you wouldn't mind staying there a weekend or something. And then some of these things uh, almost felt like a tool shed inside. The next one coming up, there was virtually no light in it. It was like a tool shed. But you know what? You, you, you pay your money and take your chances, I guess. Well, folks, that's about it. Uh, oh, yeah, toiletries? Yeah, they had to use outhouses. That's all they had. Again, there's 
there's nowhere to use facilities there. There's no electricity in those things. There's no water. You want something, you, you get up and go get it somewhere, and then you, you walk back to your, your hut. Now, what does your village look like? I don't know. One thing you got to remember about this, the one takeaway message is you got to keep criminals out of these things. That's the biggest bane, is, is, is criminals do not belong in here. A convicted felon will do nothing but cause problems. The police will end up coming over, things will start missing, broken, drug use, assaults, thefts. And then, of course, here, please to sustain who, then people don't want to finance a thing when they hear that. They say, I was going by there, and uh, here's a guy right here, arrest raises camp concerned. Now, this is not, this is just down the road from like, where I filmed it. So you've got to keep these people out. Uh, that's the number one deal. A criminal will do nothing but, uh, and when they have kids, sorry, uh, you just have to, the criminal cannot be in here, the convicted felon. A dope use and uh, drugs have no place in, in a deal like this. So anyway, folks, hope you enjoyed taking a peek at this. Late here also on the site, we're going to have a, a guy that went through, well, this shows some by hand, they had to dig these things for the city codes. A guy came by with a camera and recorded a very, very good thing. He went up and down the Oregon coast and visited all these, or many of these types of homeless shelters that we're showing you right here. Again, this one was built right here with volunteer work at Eugene, Oregon, and what a job they did. Boy, it was a lot of work. Every time I went out there, every single day, a lot was being accomplished. I never saw, and look, or it could be like this a piece of junk with just a strap thing on on the top. Uh, so it, it can be done the right way, and uh, and you can feel the energy out there. Take care. Hey, Lord bless all of you. Here's the address once again, 111 North Garfield, Eugene, Oregon. And it's called Opportunity Village. They do have a Facebook site, I'm told, and they're doing the best they can. Peace to all of you, and bye for now.